I think anybody that's been tracking what's going on in the U.S. Army's modernization effort right now uh, would agree that uh, this is truly a team of teams effort going on in the United States Army. A lot of uh, elements of the Army, uh, commands, agencies, departments, uh, offices are involved in the modernization right now. For, right now. And uh, with that brings uh, the obvious need for integration. And, uh, and that's why we've uh, titled the next panel, uh, Moderna Modernizing the Force and Integrated Team Effort. Uh, this ought to be a good, very good discussion. Chairing the panel, uh, our good friend, uh, uh, Mr. Daryl Colvin, the Deputy PEO for Missiles in Space, uh, frequent flyer up here to AUSA and many of our events. And another good friend of the association moderating today is Dr. Craig College, uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Caliber Systems, uh, who's going to manage the Q&A and discussion. So, gentlemen, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, General Swan. Let me just quickly introduce uh, the other members of the panel, and then I'll turn uh, things over to uh, Mr. Colvin. Uh, to uh, Mr. Colvin's right, we have Ms. Michelle Hodges, Senior Contracting Official, Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office from the Army Acquisition Support Center. Uh, Brigadier General uh, Tony Potts, Program Executive Officer, Soldier. Uh, Brigadier General John Rafferty, uh, Director, Long Range Precision Fires Cross-Functional Team. And Lieutenant General Retired uh, Tom Spohr, the Director for Center for Naval National Defense, at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, General Swan's introduced the topic, so I think with that, I'll just turn it over to Mr. Colvin. Hey, good morning. Uh, first of all, can I get a hua? Oh, oh, come on now. Can I get a hua? Oh. All right, hey, outstation number 45, I didn't hear you, so if you could just... <laughs> so, um, as Craig uh, stated, I like doing these events, uh, whether they're the AOCA uh, hot topics or the roundtable discussions. It's a good way to share uh, amongst the enterprise, and, and the enterprise is all of us that's in the, that are in this room today. It's, it's those that are uh, developing the requirements uh, to those that uh, are reporting on what we're doing within the defense industry. Uh, so it is an entire team effort, and, and I appreciate all those that are here today. Uh, go to the next chart. So I always like to start uh, uh, the discussion in, in really grounding ourselves in the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, so, NDS, uh, National Defense Strategy, came out uh, uh, for years. We've been looking at uh, how do we fight within uh, a multi-domain uh, construct. Uh, General Brown is one of the chief architects, and if you go back in time, as early as 2017 with General Perkins, so they started laying out the, the framework and, and really the thought process of how we were going to fight uh, as a combined arms team, as a joint team, across multiple, multiple uh, domains within the battle space. Uh, so the problem that, uh, that uh, uh, the PEO and I have really worked out uh, closely and, and we're actually uh, uh, realigning our entire program executive office around this problem set is um, aligning offensive and defensive fires capabilities across uh, multiple domains to increase joint lethality uh, and then uh, provide that freedom of action that we require in order to uh, get into a recompete mode should uh, hostilities uh, take over. Uh, so if you think about what our adversaries have, have been doing, they've been studying us, they've been adapting over time, uh, and if they've been doing it at a very rapid play, uh, pace as we've been focused on counterinsurgency and, and other priorities. Uh, we're back at it uh, with, with the onset of the modernization priorities, which was a direct pull uh, in support of multi-domain multi operations. Uh, two, of, uh, two of my counterparts are here today that I've worked very closely with, uh, General Potts uh, with uh, PEO Soldier, uh, as well as uh, General Rafferty on Long Range Precision Fires, uh, our, our key constituents that, that we team, work, uh, team with on a regular basis in order to get up these modernization priorities. From a rapid capabilities perspective, um, Ms. Hodges and the Rapid Capabilities um, and Critical Technologies Office are, are really helping us think through those dilemmas that we want to provide back to our adversaries who have been adapting to, to us over time uh, in order to, to bring that, uh, back that uh, freedom of maneuver and then that freedom of movement. Okay, uh, so what do we, uh, part of what we're trying to solve uh, is one, we, we want to regain our competitive advantage uh, in every domain, 
Okay, within the PEO missiles in space, we're really focused on the anti-access area denial aspect of the threat uh, that have developed long-range precision fires and long-range air defense over time to keep us at arm's length. So our job uh, is uh, to work through the portfolio, and within missiles in space, we handle all, all missiles, uh, tactical missiles for the Army, uh, from the tactical edge uh, of the battlefield all the way back to where we tie into the strategic and the ballistic missile defense systems. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, uh, well, we think through the various aspects of multi-domain operations. Right now we're in a compete uh, uh, mode. With the, with the onset of the Army Futures Command, the modernization priorities, and the eight uh, cross-functional teams that support that, we work very closely with them to develop those capabilities that allow us to, one, get back into a compete mode, so should hostilities take over, uh, we're able to penetrate those anti-access aero denial systems. Uh, we want to disintegrate them uh, to find areas and gaps of, and weaknesses that we can now exploit uh, with our with the soldiers at the at the forefront and our maneuver formations uh, to uh, uh, fight and defeat uh, on the objective to get us back into a recompete mode. So within the missiles in space portfolio, we handle uh, those tactical missiles that uh, the maneuver formations use all the way down to the soldier. Uh, and then we get back into our long range just, uh, precision fires uh, and our air defense systems as well. Uh, so uh, as we align uh, the joint def uh, defensive and offensive fires uh, to achieve those cross-domain effects, fires, uh, and maneuver, uh, we're really focused on now bringing on uh, the uh, aligning the people, the products, uh, and the processes in order to be successful uh, uh, with that uh, endeavor. Um, so next chart, please. So what we're doing. Uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to uh, achieve that desired outcome, uh, aligning the people, processes, and products uh, around uh, uh, the problem that we're trying to solve, which is the uh, integration of, of offensive and defensive fires, uh, we're establishing those conditions and those processes that enable the progr our program offices and, and really becomes a model across uh, the Army to find integrated solutions that are flexible, uh, relative to the acquisition methods uh, and provide increased cross, not only project coordination, but across the entire enterprise. So if you think about the, the, uh, the acquisition enterprise, a uh, very small portion of that really from an acquisition perspective, the little a, is what we provide from a material aspect. The greater portion of that, the big A uh, uh, acquisition, uh, big A, or big A being Army acquisition, uh, spans across the entire uh, set of domains from doctrine, organization, training, logistics, uh, policies, personnel, you name it. All those domains uh, that, that, we have, uh, that we have to bring to bear rapidly, not only just the material, uh, but have to bring to bear rapidly, are required in order to give that soldier the confidence to be able to fight and win on the objective. Uh, Ms. Hsu brought out some great points this morning uh, regarding prototyping that I'm going to talk about uh, with our, uh, one of our success stories, which is the initial maneuver uh, short-range air defense system. So our method, uh, we, we're keeping it simple. We're aligning the product capabilities. Uh, we've established a, an integrated fires and a rapid capabilities office. The integrated fires portion of that uh, within the PEO aligns with the other PEOs. So we have teams that work with General Potts. Uh, we also have teams that are uh, nested, or members that are nested in General Rafferty's Long Range Precision Fires cross-functional teams. Uh, got two uh, transition teams already working for the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Te Technologies Office, one for directed energy and one for long range hypersonic weapons. Uh, and then we have our teams that are working with uh, Space and Missile Defense, uh, and as well as uh, M Missile Defense Agency with the Ballistic Missile Defense Systems. So as you can see, we're uh, we're, we're taking an orga the, our organization that, as it exists today, and we're pushing them out across the enterprise so we're fully integrated. So to get an integrated capability that can fight and win on the battlefield, you have to have an integrated organization uh, that understands what joint lethality means. And it's just not the product that you're developing. You have to understand how that fits into the greater multi-domain operations. Uh, we're establishing resource allocation processes to give more, much more flexibility. Um, and, and really prioritizing across commodities. 
So one of the realignments within our PEO, I'll give you an example, we had three project offices, each one uh, managed a sensor. So I had uh, counter rockets, uh, artillery and mortars uh, uh, project office managing a sensor. I had the cruise missile defense system developing and managing a sensor. We had lower tier project office developing and managing sensors. So one of the uh, realignments within the PEO is we're bringing all those, all those sensors, and that includes uh, optical sensors as well, into one project office to be managed by one commodity PM. And the intent there is to now work with each one of our uh, CFTs and our PEO, uh, PEO uh, uh, organizations to identify those priorities and trades that need to be made to get the best solution to the warfighter uh, at the most efficient uh, way possible, okay? Uh, so our end state, um, uh, we, ex we expect to see a very responsive organization. We, we, we plan to be uh, uh, fully operational capability by uh, next year this time uh, as we realign around the capabilities for multiple end operations in support of the Army modernization strategy. So one of the acquisition and contracting acceleration success stories that I want to hit on uh, rather quickly is the initial uh, maneuver uh, short-range air defense system. Uh, go ahead, next chart. Okay, 19 months from the draft, the initial draft of the directed requirement to we have now five prototypes <clears throat> that are going through contractor and government testing. Okay, 19 months. That was an acceleration of five years had we gone down a traditional approach. So we are, we are balancing exactly what Ms. Hsu talked about earlier today relative to you have a prototype, how do you ensure that you've addressed the illities to, to get to a uh, production representative design? So the five pro, we have five prototypes that have been delivered today. Uh, in testing, we are doing find, fix, and update the design back out into the test. It's, a, it's an iterative process. We're doing that for both hardware and software. Down, right down to what are the pinch points on a hatch coming off of that striker vehicle as, as a soldier egresses in, uh, into that uh, system. So it's, it's right down to the, the finest details. We make the changes on the spot, update the design, and we move on. Yes, there's some risk associated with that. Okay, we realize that. Uh, but speed of relevance or speed of the soldier is going to require us to take some risk along the way to say, is it good enough if, at this point? Is it safe? Is it suitable? Okay, and then as we move into the next production, do we have an opportunity to update the design as we go? Is there a P through I effort? And for the initial M Shorad um, uh, uh, system, what you see here is the is a kinetic version of this system uh, that that'll defeat um, Group Ones and Two uh, UASs. It'll, it'll go after. Uh, uh, provide, provide some primary defense for the maneuver forces on the battlefield. The next instantiation of this brings in the directed energy piece that the rapid capabilities and critical technology office is working. Uh, not only from a, from a high energy laser perspective, but we're looking at, we're thinking much, much bigger. We're looking at high powered microwaves and leveraging some of the things that the, that the uh, Air Force is working. So we're, we're combining uh, our efforts not only within the Army, but across services as well in order to get to the, uh, to the end state. So some lesson learned. Uh, we have fully embraced the, the uh, authorities that Congress has provided us, thinking through the other transaction uh, agreements or authorities that are provided to us, not as the, as the total ends or means to the end, but as a tool. Because I'm a firm believer that far based contracts can be as responsive and flexible as an OTA. You just gotta work at it, okay? It, you gotta get in a room, you gotta, you gotta set your biases aside, your personal opinions aside, your emotions aside, you gotta look at the problem you're trying to solve, and you gotta do the critical thinking uh, associated to get to the end state. It's all in that, that, uh, that upfront work from a lesson learned that we found was requirements have to be well-defined upfront. Do they need to be perfect? No. Because they're going to change over time, we know that. But we, we need to have them fully vetted with industry participation to make that work. We need to get off of the, the, so we're trying to move away from this whole data rights and intellectual property fight. It's all about a license agreement strategy 
that says what data as, as the government do we need and when do we need it in order to make it effectively work for us. It's not a uh, all or nothing, I gotta have it or we're gonna walk away. It's a strategy agreed to upfront with our industrial base in order to make that a success story. Um, uh, industry partner relations, two-way communications, that were, that were, that's critical. Uh, and we didn't get locked into a single solution. This was a competitive approach from the onset. We had industry bring their solutions, their prototypes, initially out to White Sands Missile Range. We wanted to see what they had and what they could offer. And what we found was no one solution uh, uh, satisfied all the requirements, but we found a good integrator. We found a good mission equipment package uh, developer. Okay, and we found a, uh, a pretty good turret designer. Okay, and combined, uh, we, went, we, we initially put it a, comp we, we did it competitively, we awarded a competitive development, and now we're transitioning into a FAR-based production contract. So the OTA was just a, a means to get us started and, and get the process rolling, so concurrently we could work the contracting strategy to get to the uh, production design and, and, uh, and deliveries. Uh, and just one last note, um, uh, one thing that General Rash and I have pressed hard, we, we have heard industry or our senior, Army senior leadership. Uh, we think about risk a lot. So when it comes down to a contract, what drives a contract? Contract type, risk, okay? And from that perspective, if the risk is sufficiently mitigated, we're going we're gonna to drive for a fixed price contract in a competitive environment, whether it's development whether it's for hardware or relative, relative to software. And it's kind of interesting, I had a, non, a lot of non-believers initially, but over this past year, if you've been paying attention, uh, we just awarded a lower tier air missile defense sensor. Competitively awarded fixed price. We took the Sentinel A4 uh, radar, which is our short range air defense radar, being updated to be a, uh, to be a digital radar with GAN. Started out as a cost plus effort. Okay, we're in, we're in uh, almost at, at the ready to award after we went through the whole competitive experience. So it was a competitive cost plus. We stopped it. We had the team go back to the drawing board and we ended up awarding a, a fixed price competitive award and we didn't lose any schedule. Why? Because we had great industry participation. They were able to turn and we were able to turn the, the statement of work from a cost plus uh, statement of work into a fixed price. So it does work. And let me tell you, software is the same. Agile, agile software, when you look at it, agile uh, DevSecOps and how we employ that, uh, we just awarded a contract, competitive, fixed price for agile software. So it can be done, okay? You, you, you just have to have that communication early, up front, okay? And you gotta be willing to share the information in order to get to the outcome that you wanna achieve. All right, so I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. So the Army's Rapid Capability and Critical Technologies Office has undergone quite a transformation in the last year. Um, I'll refer to it as RICTO for short because it's easier to say. <laughs> but about this time last year, the Secretary of the Army realized that he wanted something different out of the previous organization, the Rapid Capabilities Office, and recharted us to really focus on delivering experimental prototypes with residual combat capabilities in areas of strategic importance and also for critical outcomes. And so kind of reset us. We're led by Lieutenant General Neil Thorgood. He's our director. He's the director for hypersonics, directed energy space, and rapid acquisition. Um, we are led and given assignments from a board of directors that has the top Army leadership, the secretary, the under, the chief, the vice, and the new additions were Dr. Jetty as the AAE and also General Murray as the commander of Army Futures Command. This really aligned us and made sure the projects we're working on are totally in sync with the Army modernization priorities and allowed us to do some cross-cutting partnerships, as Daryl mentioned, with the other PEOs, the CFTs, and across the enterprise to make sure that the Army has a good decision point to make. So our focus really is on helping Army make long-term strategic decisions in the, in the future. So our first assignment was for the long-range hypersonic weapon. We um, aggregated a team, took the, the engineers who have been working on this technology for years, pulled them into our organization, pulled in represent, 
representatives from the PEO into the organization, um, partnered very closely with General Rafferty's team and the requirements developers to make sure that we deliver a capability on a very short time schedule that will give some incremental improvement to what is there today. So within 24 months, we're delivering experimental prototypes of the long range hypersonic weapon for a battery. So the unit of action, it's a smaller unit. We're not looking and saying this is gonna solve the Army's problems, but we wanna test out this prototype and make sure one, is it reasonable? Does it need to go to a program of record? But really to help the Army make a decision in the future. Um, we also have since then been assigned missions in directed energy. We do not have a space mission yet, but we will await any direction from the board of directors. On the critical outcome side, rapid acquisition, where project office there works on projects that are not aligned in hypersonics directed energy or space. And so we have um, uh, several different projects that we're working in that area. We're also looking with our computing and electronics and security dominance team working on cyber aspects, pr um, system protection type things. And then we have an advanced concepts and experimentation group that is out sourcing technologies, um, really with the non-traditionals in the commercial industry, technologies that are not being utilized by the Army today but maybe have an application that we haven't thought of yet to be able to pull those in and push those into one of our prototyping projects should the Army decide to go that way. I think um, you know, one of the more exciting things about what we're doing is the, the way that we have the IPT set up. So we have project offices that are set up for a specific mission set. We're aggregating matrix organizations in, using our acquisition and contracting expertise that reside within the RICDO to develop those prototypes and strategies and bridge that gap of the um, S&T demos that are usually done with actual prototyping and the technical data required for a PO to take this and put it out in the Army inventory if that's what the Army desires to do. When those projects are complete, those matrix people will either go back to their parent organizations or transition with the project to continue to get it across the finish line. Um, in doing that, we're utilizing a lot of different contract mechanisms. So one of the other unique things about the RICTO is that we have procurement authority from Dr. Jetty. Um, we're able to leverage um, any Army contract um, that exists, but also execute our own contracts when necessary. And that has really given us the freedom to look across um, traditional far base contracts as well as uh, OTAs and other agreements as appropriate for the mission that we've been given. With our prototyping mission, we do employ a lot of prototyping OTAs, um, the collaborative environment of being able to see what's available and what the outcomes can be as we go through that competitive process has been very beneficial. And I see us continuing to use that in our prototyping mission set. So it's been an exciting year. We will continue to transform, but that's kind of where we are today to give you an update on the RICDO and I'll turn it over to General Pass. All right, <clears throat> so I think it was great, almost two years ago, I took over the PEO, I didn't have a deputy, so I called my good friend Daryl Colvin and I said, hey, there's a great opportunity uh, for you to come up and spend a little time as a deputy PEO, you know, kind of get you set up for success for the future. And Daryl showed up and I said, there's one thing I might have forgot to tell you. I said, I'm, I'm leaving for Capstone um, <laughs> next week and you're going to be the PEO uh, for the next six weeks. Congratulations. So I think that my call to come and sit on this panel might have been a little bit of payback. Uh, <laughs> Daryl doesn't forget. Uh, but it's great to see everybody on the panel. Um, <clears throat> and I think maybe what we show is a little bit of a diversity from kind of the major weapon systems platforms to the uh, to the lethality pieces, which uh, I know my team doesn't like to hear me call them commodity products, but it's, but, but in the grand scheme of what we do, we tend to have the, uh, more of a little commodity uh, type mentality, uh, but, but the ability to turn very rapidly. And so I think what I've got up here is what, <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit about capabilities in the white space. This has been a big theme for uh, me over the past several months uh, with a team. And so I want to talk a little bit about it and, and understand that this, what I, what I think we need to have uh, uh, this kind of enterprise team level approach to uh, delivering capability and delivering capability more rapidly than we've been able to deliver in the past. <clears throat> so 
And, and as, I, as I work through this chart to try to convey the point, uh, I would probably change it a little bit. You see this, uh, the words adaptive squad architecture in the top. So the, the first thing I think that we require uh, to do this as a teaming approach is we have to have a government-owned architecture that everybody understands and everybody can build to. If, you, if we don't have that, then we're just left with a, a large number of proprietary type solutions that we then are trying to figure out how to integrate, uh, which is never an efficient means or model. So I will tell you by, you know, on the, on the 23rd of January, I think we'll, we'll be the official rollout of our version one of our adaptive squad architecture, which is the government owned architecture for the squad. Now we're very intentional about the squad. Now we talk about the soldiers and integrated combat platform or an integrated weapons platform and the squad is an integrated combat platform. And those are, they sound simple, but they mean a whole lot in the terms of how do you develop capability. And I don't mean how do you develop products, I mean how do you develop capabilities. And so we talk about this as capability in the white space, so you have to have that. Now the other two pieces that I think are highly critical to this, uh, which we're working significantly on, are soldier tactical power. Uh, it will become the Achilles heel uh, of the infantryman because everything we're putting on that soldier is now requiring some form of power and we just cannot continue to upload batteries. Uh, we've got to find a better way to manage it, better power uh, distribution, better power output. So that's one of our, we, we call them problem sets, not requirements, but we are talking about problem sets. The other piece is that I would tell you that belongs on here uh, to hold this together is processing. Everything that we do really is requiring some form of onboard compute uh, and on, onboard storage. And that's all gonna fit in as part of the architecture because we want to own that. We want to now treat the soldier and the squad in the same manner that we treat a major combat platform where it's a systems engineering approach to where you are giving, it's basically a swap. Uh, and we tell you where you draw your power from. We tell you where your compute storage is, where your, how much capacity you have. Uh, and then we'll provide those. Uh, I'm not interested right now in everybody bringing their own compute solutions, their own storage solutions, their own battery solutions. What I'm saying is we'll own the infrastructure and the architecture. And what I'm asking is industry to bring capability that fits within that architecture. I'll kind of go through just real quick. So you see around the green, these are products. And we're good at this. We build products, and, and my teams, like all these other teams, uh, they're exceptional at what they do. Uh, and they are going to provide an exceptional product. I don't want to have to build a new product every time we want a new capability. That's where I think we go wrong. And, and so, I, listen, I got, a, I got my Kentucky high school education, so I'll keep this simple because uh, it's about all I know how to do. Um, so I go back to the iPhone and the Android, right? What, what creates an explosion of capability? It's not that we're building new iPhones and new Androids every day. It's that everybody out there understands what the architecture is. There's a software development toolkit, right? There's an architecture. And anybody who knows how to write code can go into this, write code, and create by using the, the peripheral devices, using the, the storage, the battery that's already on there. Listen, nobody has to go out and re rebuild towers, right? We simply use the towers and the infrastructure and the architecture that exist, but they're giving us more and more capability. Every time you turn your phone on, you get a new update, there's a new software application, there's something, and we're using it for things that we never really envisioned before, but it's fantastic capability. So we, we think about this from the soldier and the squad perspective the same way, and I'll, I'll give you an example and then, and then we'll move on. I don't wanna take a lot of the time. Uh, here, but for instance, you see up in the uh, what's in the upper left hand corner as you're looking at this is the ENVGB. We started feeling the ENVGB late September, early October to 2 1. Absolutely fabulous capability, best uh, night vision device we've ever fielded, thermal channel, uh, it's fully integrated. Uh, we can bring in augmented reality uh, into this. In and of itself, best night vision device we've ever fielded. And if that's all we gave our soldiers, it would be fantastic. That's one. Then we have another thing in here called the Family of Weapon Sites Individual, the FWSI. So it's down uh, clockwise around, uh, I guess it's about at your uh, seven o'clock position. Great thermal capability to identify targets at range. 
Now, we need this because the enemy is getting more sophisticated in how they, if, if, a, if a soldier lights up a PEC-15 on the battlefield, the chances that they will be seen are pretty high because technology now exists where you can see it when we, when we light up. So we need more of a passive thermal device to protect our soldiers. So in and of itself, absolutely fantastic capability. But because we've built an architecture and we understand the architecture, and we have this thing called an intra-soldier wireless, which you do see on there, which now creates a four-meter bubble around a soldier. It's right now 128-bit uh, kilobit encrypted or bit encrypted. It's going to 256, and we have signed out the architectural standard for how you have to operate on that, 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 that device. So we make it public. It tells you how to do it, right? We can now combine those capabilities. And what I mean is that, 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 that our site, that our, they can reach out 900 meters, and identify a target passively, that's really cool. But now I can pass it up to my goggles, and in, inside that 40-degree field of view, I can now bring in also an 18-degree field of view that shows a target that's up to 900 meters out, and I never, that soldier actually never has to raise his weapon to his eye to see the sight and put it on target. And in fact, if the soldier has a means to defile himself or stand behind uh, an area of cover and move his weapon around that, he can engage a target without, uh, without exposing himself to the enemy. That's what we, now I don't have a program, nobody, I don't have a line that says rapid target acquisition. I don't have that. But think about this, we created a capability in the white space by having an architecture that we all understand, and I don't even need a new funding line for it. I simply needed the capability gap, and to do this, and again, now it's about the squad, and it's about that soldier's integrated combat platform, and I, and I could go through many, many examples of that type of capability that you see on these starburst that we're creating in the white space that nobody's written me a requirement for, but it truly is about squad level lethality that we can do very rapidly. And it just simply comes as part of the way we field these products to our soldiers. That goes across the entire enterprise. I know Daryl and his team have taken our software development kit, understanding of the architecture with their Stinger guys, and they have created a Stinger targeting that we can use, right? They didn't have to create anything else. They're using our infrastructure, our architecture, our software development toolkit, but they're now creating a targeting system for the Stingers, and we're gonna bring that back into the FWSI to create a precision targeting that we've never had before, but we didn't have to create a new program to do it. That's just an example, and we can go across the board at a number of these things. So I'll stop there. Looking forward to your questions. Cheers. Uh, thank you, and thanks to the AUSA team uh, for this opportunity, uh, because it helps us, uh, quite frankly, be an integrated team uh, with, our, uh, with our industry partners that we don't get to see as much uh, being located at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, so our team at Fort Sill is about 24 or 25 uh, people now, and, uh, but there's many more at Detroit, uh, at Picatinny, at uh, Redstone Arsenal with the uh, PEOs and PMs, uh, and with our uh, CCDC lab partners. Uh, and then a whole bunch more uh, from industry and other places. Uh, but, um, but I think our location at, uh, at, uh, at Fort Sill means that we've got to be, you know, the, the team in that has to be a verb. We have to work really hard uh, to, uh, to maintain our team and, and work really hard to try to be as much uh, on, you know, Mr. Colvin and, and, the, and PM rocket, uh, missiles in space we have to be on their team as much as they're on ours, as an example. Uh, so... Uh, so that's, um, that's what over the last 15 months, I think I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to be a good teammate uh, and, uh, and trying to, um, as our mission statement says, to try to lead this modernization effort across the FFME without command authority. Uh, so Army Futures Command has uh, unity of command. We rely on unity of effort. Uh, and those um, very clear priorities that have been set by the senior leaders of the Army uh, helps a lot with that. But, uh, but not everybody's got the memo. So uh, th while there aren't, you know, there are antibodies that are out there that, that, uh, that kind of limit um, our ability to move fast. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's not, I'm sorry, most of the time, it's not out of ill will. Uh, it's, um, it's that we're asking people to change the way they're doing business. And they've spent their entire careers doing it one way. And now we're telling them we don't like it. Let's do it different. Uh, without telling them necessarily how. 
so, uh, so we are working together across the FFME uh, to try to move as quickly as we can. One advantage of our location at Fort Sill is that, uh, is that every day that I'm there, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's PT in the morning or whether it's at the barbershop or wherever it is, um, because of the major training mission that Fort Sill has, we see the future section chiefs, uh, future platoon sergeants, first sergeants, battery commanders of the first hypersonic battery, of the, uh, the first IRCA battery, of the first uh, rocket unit that's equipped with the precision strike missile. And so then we know, if you look at the pacing threat also, you know that we're not, you know, it's not really a euphemism, but we're not delivering capability. We're, we're providing these soldiers and leaders what they're going to need to do to fight with the equipment that they need to fight and win. And, you know, how the, you know, General Milley puts it, the unforgiving crucible of ground combat. Uh, and so calling it anything other than that, sometimes it tends to, like, diminish the urgency of our mission. Uh, which is, like I said, if you look at the pacing threat, there isn't a day to lose. There isn't any time to waste uh, gnashing of teeth over what a level of significant contribution is in a, uh, in a contract. Uh, so, um, so we try to emphasize the urgency of the mission uh, and the criticality in delivering this capability out there. Uh, so, um, so that's one of the, um, you know, I think the, 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 a huge responsibility for the cross-functional teams is to, is to work through that. Um, all of our partners across the Future Force Modernization Enterprise uh, want the same thing. Our interests aren't exactly the same. They're aligned, but they're not the same. And often the way that, that our interests are, are uh, formalized uh, is through the use of a contract. Uh, and, uh, and so whether it's in our research and development, our S&T, or it's uh, producing the prototypes, everything comes down to a, uh, to a contract. So that integrated team effort has to work across um, this entire uh, future force modernization enterprise to get there. And quite frankly, we're making a lot of progress. So this time last year, a lot of the things we were doing were just kind of an idea. Uh, and now we're very close uh, to delivering the first extended range cannon artillery system prototype to Yuma Proving Grounds. Our, uh, one of our, uh, our HQE is up at, um, at uh, Picatinny right now doing a, a really important design-related soldier touchpoint. So he's bringing uh, non-commissioned officers from Fort Sill up to Picatinny uh, to, um, uh, to work through a couple of uh, design issues. Uh, and that'll go into to the, to the next increment, to the later prototypes. Uh, but that first prototype, I mean, they're just they're tightening the bolts. Uh, and then it's going to be on its way to Yuma. And very early next year, we'll go in right into the shakedown testing and the technology and readiness level six demonstration. But even while we're doing that, uh, while that's still, you know, happening, uh, there's uh, the extended range cannon artillery is a system of the platform, uh, the projectiles, the propellant, uh, the course correcting fuses, and all that testing is going on at the same time, uh, using howitzer test beds with the uh, with 58 caliber gun tube. Uh, and so the reason why I mention all this is is to uh, uh, is to Ms. Hsu's point earlier about have we thought through things? Um, the answer is yes, but it doesn't mean we have the plan yet. Uh, the The point that I'm making here is that is that all these things are happening simultaneously. Uh, we're we're not skipping steps. We're compressing activity by doing things in a simultaneous manner. Uh, we're not done with the requirement, but we're delivering the first prototype. We have the abbreviated CDD approved, uh, but we know that that abbreviated CDD is going to turn into uh, a CDD over time. Uh, it's going to get improved. The f when we deliver that first howitzer uh, uh, prototype, we're going to have cannoneers crawling all over it. So that prototype two is better than prototype one, uh, and we go from there. So that um, so that the simultaneous activity uh, is uh, is an important thing to uh, to highlight, and that and that really the theme for our cross-functional team is that there aren't any more handoffs, uh, that there isn't a handoff from the concept over to the requirements people, then over to the S and T community, and we just sort of throw it over the fence. That that we are linked together, um, we're arm in arm, uh, and. RPM is working with our requirements team on developing it, uh, so that uh, so that the, we get the requirement right. To, to you know, a, a point that's been made several times, uh, that we're working with the hypersonic program office on writing the requirement for the long range hypersonic weapon, for the initial prototypes that will be delivered. And we're already thinking, and I've got a you know homework assignment due at the end of this week on what are the desired capabilities for the improved long range hypersonic weapon. 
So, um, so this, uh, I just sort of want to highlight this integrated team uh, is, is really uh, an important um, aspect of how we're doing business differently. And that means that sometimes it's awkward. Uh, that, um, that, that often we get in each other's uh, space, but it's, it's not so much between us and the, and, the, and the PEOs and the PMs. We work together great. Like I said, we're on each other's teams. Uh, it's often when it gets sort of a level up from that, in, the, in that you know, void between execution and policy, that, um, that, that often it, uh, it, gets, um, it gets awkward. Uh, but, uh, but we're, we're um, like I said, we're working through that as a, uh, as a team, a couple points about contracts is uh, is that you know we're using using the heck out of uh, of OTAs, uh, and uh, and they really have helped us get to this level. We know we're going to have to transition these things to uh, to traditional programs. Uh, one, the Precision Strike Missile is already a program of record that's been accelerated about four years, uh, and um, and there are challenges with that. Uh, but uh, but to Daryl's point about you can be competitive in this uh, in this process. I think their office has been very creative uh, in their approach to enhanced uh, uh, TMRR, keeping something competitive as long as we can before a down select will help us get the best product from our vendors uh, and, uh, and potentially the best price uh, for the taxpayer. Uh, and we all ought to want that, even while we're accelerating it. Uh, they aren't a magic wand. Right? I mean, to the point earlier about how they were designed to be used for, uh, for small business, for non-traditional partners, yet we're kind of flipped it on its head. We're using it for traditional partners who are bringing on small business, uh, and it's not, it's not perfectly designed for that. It's not optimized for that, but, but it works, uh, and we're making it work. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hard, even as you know, authorities and roles and missions are still being worked out. Um, I think a couple things that, uh, that work that are great for us is the continued expanding memberships in the consortia uh, and the fact that there's a couple opportunities a year now to, to, uh, to get ideas out there. Uh, that's one of the things I think our cross-functional teams needs, needs to do better at is taking advantage of opportunities like this and, and forums provided by AUSA and the consortia to deliver our problems out there. What I've learned through our use for our partnership with the Army Applications Lab is that we haven't cornered the market on good ideas. We have the best labs in the world, we have best industry partners, but we, ha we don't have all the good ideas, and we'd have to do a better job. I underestimated the importance of problem framing uh, and getting those problems out there so that we can attract uh, the, um, the innovative uh, community that's out there that can help us uh, solve some of our problems. So with that, I'll, um, I'll close and turn it over uh, to our next panelist. Sir. Well, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. And uh, I'll share that I think there's been a horrible mistake made here that uh, I'm an acquisition level zero uh, professional, as opposed to some of my colleagues here. But I am a generalist, and I've been looking at modernization now for maybe uh, 15, 20 years. And so I just want to share some of my thoughts. Some of them might be provocative, but that's the luxury and benefit of wearing a coat and tie versus uh, camouflage. I think fundamentally there's a lot of room for optimism about where the Army is right now on both acquisition and modernization. And I don't want to curry favor, but I think you can point a lot of that credit back to the team that we have right now, people like uh, Esper, who was there for a while, McCarthy, Millie, McConville, uh, Jetty, and now uh, Mike uh, Murray at Army Futures Command. Very experienced leaders, know what they want to do. Um, we've had great leaders before, and Secretary Shu, I point to you. She's been our, she was a Bryce Harper. Any Nats fans out there, I should ask. Okay, so we have a few Nats fans. So we've had some Bryce Harpers, we've had some Ryan Zimmermans, but we, never really put it together like we have put it together right now with people that are focused on getting things done and understand the business. And so I think we're in a very uh, good position right now and maybe we can stay that way uh, for a year, maybe two if we're in the lucky, but then we're gonna have the inevitable transition that hits senior army leadership. And we may not get, frankly, the same set of cards that we've gotten. And so we've had good leaders in the past, but we've had some that were just not proficient in this area, maybe congressmen, maybe lawyers, things like that. And so the question in my mind that looms is how does the Army sustain this momentum for the long term? Because when you look back at problems that we've had in modernization, oftentimes it's a leader that didn't share the same thoughts about getting things done that actually intervenes to stop a program. Uh, despite some initial concerns I had about Army Futures Command, I am 
I'm past all that. I think there were concerns, at least I had some, that Army leaders seeking to make a change reached for the first tool, which is usually to grab the org chart and put a, and throw a wrench into it and make changes. And I think Army Futures Command, even though they're in recent, I mean, they're, they're fairly new, but they have done a lot of great messaging and talking, and I think everyone is now convinced uh, that that's the way to go. Um, in the course of creating cross-functional teams, which General Rafferty talked about, they have pulled a lot of the co communities together that were at odds in the past, like requirements and concepts and things like that. In so doing, however, we ought not to overlook the fact that they have opened up new gaps. So when you pull a group of people together, you have pulled them away from other relationships they had. And so, for example, just in conversations with some of the other centers of excellence that are not represented by a cross-functional team, and some of the labs that are not represented by a cross-functional team, they have questions about where do they stand in this new army. And so I, I'm not singling out, but Maneuver Support Center of Excellence, Sustainment Center of Excellence, how do they play in this, how do they get their money prioritized? And for an army as complex as ours, when you prioritize something like the optionally manned fighting vehicle very high, you have to be very careful that you have similarly prioritized the maintenance and the fueling capabilities of that system, otherwise you will be feeling unbalanced capability. And there may be a plan that I'm just not privy to, but I don't see that a lot. I want to talk for a moment about culture. Uh, to their credit, Army leaders are spending a lot of time talking and thinking about modernization. And I, you know, there's a story that says that the cross-functional teams meet with an Army leader like once a week, different functional teams coming in, talking to the vice or the under, even the secretary and the chief. And that is good because in many cases we had modernization programs running on autopilot. And sometimes that was good and sometimes they needed a course correction. Previous Army modernization efforts often suffered from groupthink, the phenomena where subordinates unquestionably assume the beliefs and the positions of their senior officers, even when their internal compass told them there was something wrong with that program. And these subordinates retain those beliefs even in the face of conflicting evidence. The future combat system suffered from that. People, you know, at my level, colonels, lieutenant colonels, we knew that sucker had some problems. That We kept trying to patch that ship, trying to keep, keep get, get it going. People were not able to make the same, the hard choices. Ground combat vehicle. Senior leader said we want a vehicle that holds an entire infantry squad and has the protection necessary uh, equivalent to an MRAP. That generates a vehicle that weighs more than a tank. But we didn't see that problem, and then eventually uh, somebody else canceled that program out from under us. We lost billions of dollars in that. And people at various levels of the Army knew that was a problem. They knew that the GCV was not a well-structured program, and yet we kept going ahead. And that's groupthink. And so Army leaders, I talked about how much guidance they're giving. When Army leaders give a lot of guidance, people below them often believe that that guidance is now above the scrutiny of the law. And that's not what we need. And so I watch all the services now in my new position. There's a lot of people in the Air Force, for example, criticizing the direction that the Air Force goes on their programs. I don't see that in the Army. Everybody in the Army, to their credit, salutes. And everybody in the Army, to their detriment, salutes. And we move ahead. And so I want to see a lot more healthy criticism and discussion about Army programs in the future. Uh, third concern, I'm interested in about how the Army reacts to failure. And you've heard about some great successes here. And Secretary McCarthy talks about his 31 signature programs with a lot of pride. And it's useful for a leader like Secretary McCarthy to be so invested in his programs. But it would defy the odds if every one of those 31 programs was appropriately conceptualized, the requirements were right, the funding was right, and the employment concepts were right. It would just deploy, it would defy all odds. At least one and maybe multiples of that 31 programs have problems or will have problems. And it's, so it's almost certain that one will fail or one will be terminated, maybe even soon. And General Murray talked about this in an article that uh, Sidney wrote in Breaking Defense, said that Failure is an option, and I commend that article to you, even though most of the stuff that Sydney, well, anyhow. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, General Murray, you know, addressed this problem up front. He, he, he said, yeah, we're going to fail, and how we react to that failure 
will be defining. Do we do like we have so often sometimes done in the past, try and put patches on the program, try and modify the PowerPoint charts to make it look like it's not failure, or do we cut bait, as they say, and say this thing did not work out, we're getting as much of our money out of it as we can while we still have money in it before OSD takes that money? For me, that's going to be a huge thing as to how do we react to failure in the Army. And then my final concern, there's, you might have been following this, it's not an Army program, the uh, Joint Enterprise Defense Infrastructure, or JEDI contract, cloud computing contract. Uh, a lot of press recently talked about how Amazon has filed suit believing that President Trump's very public comments as both as a candidate and as president, you know, a, a not speaking poorly about Amazon may have led the Pentagon to give that contract to Microsoft. And so I said I wasn't an acquisition professional, uh, professional but one day uh, Kevin, Fahey, he, Kevin Fahey had me on a source selection panel to his great regret. But, <laughs> but I still live with the fear that I would inevitably, you know, somehow it disclosed some element of what went on in that source selection panel. I mean, the, what goes on in source selection panels in the DOD is something we should be proud of. I mean, we were all sworn to secrecy. I can't even tell you what the program was. But, you know, DOD should be proud of its contracting processes, proud of the rigor and the scrutiny. And everybody in this source selection panel was old and gray-haired like I was, you know, and there was nobody in there that was going to be even mildly subject to any political exterior, uh, external influence. And so I think the Army and the DOD has a communications problem because the American public believes that the Pentagon might make acquisition contract award decisions like that capriciously based on external circumstances. And ladies and gentlemen, the next couple of years are going to be hard for defense funding, I think. Uh, it's going to be an issue in this upcoming election, and depending on how that comes out, some people say we've already hit the high point uh, of DOD funding. I don't know. I hope not. But if we have, having the trust and confidence of the American people in our acquisition process is going to be paramount. So I thank you very much. I look forward to your questions as well. Okay, so you had to bring in uh, the Honorable Faye. So um, because you did that, uh, I'm going to hit one of the questions uh, that talks about the uh, what are the top three acquisition and contracting policy barriers to quickly and efficiently modernize the force. Uh, I'm going to answer that in a different way. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to be an optimist, uh, and I tend to think through how to solve the problem. If there's a barrier, then I really haven't put the critical thinking in to how to solve it. Uh, so I've known Mr. Fahey for years when I was an iron major working for PM Bradley. Um, he worked within uh, PEOGCSS at the time. And uh, uh, he was true to the form then, and he still is today. And he will tell you, and, and as he's mentored me over the years, he, says, he said, Daryl, you can do anything in acquisition if you have three things. Okay, if you have agreement on requirements, if you have uh, stable funding, and if you have decisions. And my message to you is uh, the way the enterprise has been structured today and the teamwork that you see across uh, the, the Army within the, the AFC and the CFTs, the RCCTO, getting into the joint uh, staff, getting into uh, Missile Defense Agency. And I'll tell you, there's some programs that, uh, that I was recently involved with that and I walk into a meeting and, and I've got uh, – the FBI, I've got Homeland Security, and I've got Border Patrol. So it's not just within our defense in, uh, uh, enterprise, it's across the enterprise that within that group, if you can agree on the requirements and you can work the funding and you have the support of the, the senior leaders on decisions, there's nothing we can't do from an acquisition perspective. And I believe the Honorable Fahey when he says that today. And that's what we strive for as we work uh, to bring down those barriers. So I'll, I'll pass it on either to uh, General Potts or uh, General Rafferty on, the, on barriers if they want to comment. So I don't know if this specifically addresses the question, but, uh, but one of the, the barriers is, uh, I think, in, uh, we, we are challenged to really talk about what the risks are in a program, that uh, that that the whole enterprise is designed to reduce all the risks, right? And, uh, and it seems like the way we reduce risk is by adding time and money uh, and not really elevating the risks uh, like we do in every other mission. 
the risk is identified, and then we decide to either add resources, change the mission, or accept it. Uh, and uh, and we don't give uh, opportunities for uh, for leaders at the at the at the appropriate levels in this. I think to really address those, uh, look at those risks uh, head on. And then if uh, and if something help happens to the program, it's always a problem with the requirement. Which um, which I, I, I'm not so sure that that's that's really true. That's a way you can point blame, but everybody else gets to gets to address risks uh, by adding money and time. Uh, and we didn't have enough time, or we didn't have enough money, so we couldn't, uh, couldn't make it work. And I I'm, I'm probably didn't answer the, the question very well, but, uh, but I did want to address that to the, to the audience here. That this risk question is something that even after 15 months is still, uh, is still kind of vexing for me. Ms. Heisers? Yeah, so another thing the Army's done over the last year or so is really looked at its policies and determined what was still relevant and where the approval thresholds could be lowered. So you've seen a lot more delegations to the POs and PMs, and even in the contracting community, um, what SCOs can approve, what their chief of contracting officers can approve, and even what that KO on the ground can improve themselves. And so that has allowed us to accelerate a lot of what we're doing. And so I'm with you, sir. I don't see many policies as being a barrier. If you apply the critical thinking and, and think through your strategy, you're able to execute usually within the authorities that you have in your internal organization, and you don't need to go ask for additional help. Okay, I see our time is up. I want to thank our panel members one more time. Great discussion. Great questions. I'm, I'm sure you'll rope some of these folks before they escape and uh, continue the discussion. So thank you all very much.